John Perret. I'm here from Washington University. Hope you can all hear me okay in the back. Um, I'm here going to I'm going to talk to you about isotopic switching demonstrated using TAP2 experiments. And first of all, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Dr. John Gleaves, inventor of the TAP machine, uh, Dr. Gregory Blonsky, who is our theoretician, uh, Dr. Rebecca Fushimi, who was not able to make it today. She collected a, a large portion of this data. Uh, Shaolin Zhang, Eugene Redekop, my fellow graduate students. Um, this work was supported uh, by NSF Goldie Grant, and it was in combination with Ram and Haas. So this works here. There we go. Uh, so today, can you still hear me? If I talk over here, I want to get okay. um, I'd like to talk to you uh, briefly. Here we go. Well, it looks like I don't have a laser, but I'm going to talk to you about uh, catalyst preparation. Uh, which is an atomic beam deposition system that we've built and some interesting uh, tests that we ran on that. And then I'd like to give you a quick overview of the TAP reactor system. And I'm going to cover four experiments uh, which lead me to really the, the main focus of the talk, which is finally the isotopic switching pump probe experiment. All right, so forward and onward, here we go. Uh, so one of the big developments in our lab over the past couple of years uh, has been the development of an atomic beam deposition system. Uh, you may be familiar, atomic beam is used a lot in the, uh, in the circuits industry. Uh, people use it to make thin films and things like this. Uh, but we want to do something a little bit different. Uh, we want to take an existing catalyst or, or uh, a uh, inert, in our case silica particles, as is shown in the picture there. And uh, we can put them in this deposition system and vibrate the bed. Okay? And then we can deposit some sort of transition metal. In my case, it's going to be uh, palladium today. Um, and we can, uh, we can uh, achieve some type of uniform coverage on these particles. Okay, so we have some type of uniform catalyst now, and we'd like to test it with our TAP apparatus. Um, the idea is that now we can continue going back and forth in this circular manner between characterization and uh, catalyst manufacturing. Okay. Uh, the reaction of interest, for me, because it's a nice and simple one, is going to be simply CO oxidation uh, using uh, stored oxygen that's held in the catalyst. Right. So that's pretty much the background. So the first experiment we did, and I apologize, it looks like my, uh, my friend Bill Gates will not allow me to label my axes uh, since I did this on a Mac. But in any case, uh, this is CO oscillation during temp uh, temperature program reaction. So the y-axis is uh, CO conversion, okay, and the x-axis is temperature. Okay, and, and the temperature goes from room temperature on the, on, on the left all the way to 400 degrees Celsius on the right. And we notice that there's a peak at roughly 150 degrees, and we get this really obscure behavior where we have these oscillations as we continue ramping this temperature. Okay? That was a little bit unexpected when we first found this, and in fact we thought there was some experimental error and things like this, and we redid the experiment multiple, multiple times, and lo and behold, the same uh, type of behavior occurred over and over again. Um, so we realize that there must be some type of structure that is affecting this complex behavior. Okay? And I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with a question. Now we're going to try to understand what is this underlying structure that's causing this oscillatory behavior. Right. So let me just give you a quick uh, briefer on the TAP reactor. Um, it was invented. Uh, back in the 80s by uh, Dr. Gleaves. He was back at Monsanto. And it's essentially comprised of three parts. The upper part is a manifold assembly, which has some fast-acting pulse valves. Okay? These are similar, uh, similar in idea to the fuel injectors in your car. Very fast response times. So on the order of, of 5 times 10 to the negative fourth seconds. Very quick. Okay. Uh, then we have the micro-reactor itself, which is in the middle, and it's heated. And then we have, at the end, we have a, a vacuum system with a quadruple mass spectrometer. Now, as Dr. Blonsky always says, one of, one of the main things about TAP is that all of the transport, or excuse me, transport occurs uh, due to our friend, nuts and diffusion. Okay, so nuts and diffusion is our friend in this particular case. Um, so as we transverse through, I'm going to have, I'm going to show you this little, uh, this little fancy animation that will work. Um, so you see we have some gas particles in the, in the, uh, in, the, in, in the pulse valve, okay, we're going to open up this, this yellow valve at the bottom, and hopefully you're going to hear some pulsing. Now, every time we pulse, excuse me, pulse, um, our, our mass spectrometer can only pick up one uh, uh, charge to mass ratio, okay? So for the first pulse, 
we're going to pick up in, in the, the inner. You hear that? You hear it pulsing? The next pulse, we're going to pick up the reactant. And then the next pulse, we'll pick up the product. And we'll continue doing this over and over and over again. I'm going to stop after two pulses. Okay. All right, so that's, that's the idea. Now, essentially, each one of these graphs uh, is on, 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 the, on the y axis is exit flow, okay, and on the x axis is time. And what we can do is essentially these are, are concentrations of that particular molecule at the exit of the reactor, okay? All right. So that's the idea. Now, for every one of these pulses, uh, we can do some, some uh, mathematics here and do some integration. And we can calculate a whole host of things using moment analysis, conversion being one of them. That's the one that I'm going to focus on today. But we can also do some other things like selectivity, product yield, residence time, uh, apparent rate constants, and apparent time delay. But essentially, the, the, the main idea I want you to take away from this is that we use moment analysis. So we essentially integrate these curves. Okay? All right. So the first experiment we do is we want to have a rough idea how much oxygen storage can our platinum catalyst that we made in our, in our deposition system hold? How much oxygen can it hold? So we go through a procedure where we completely reduce the catalyst at, at atmospheric conditions, okay, at elevated temperatures. And then we begin by pulsing, pulse by pulse, uh, a small amount of oxygen into the reactor. Okay? Now, the data on top shows our, our, our rough data. So you see in the beginning, there's nothing. There's no oxygen exiting the reactor, which tells us that all of that oxygen that's being pulsed in is somehow staying on the catalyst. Okay? And then clearly it goes to some match. So if we do our moment analysis, and we convert that raw data into this, this chart down here, you can see we just have normalized moment on the y-axis and pulse number on the x. Okay, and we get this nice curve. So now what we can do is, by using the ratios of these geometric shapes, the green uh, shape as compared to the, the orange rectangle, and knowing how many molecules we pulse in on every pulse, we can calculate the total number of oxygen atoms that have been absorbed by this catalyst. Okay? All right. Moving on. So that's the first experiment. The second experiment we can do is called the uh, TAP pulse response CO conversion experiment. And this is a little bit different. Uh, in this particular experiment, we completely uh, oxidize the catalyst by allowing it to equilibrate at, at, uh, at high temperatures and atmospheric conditions of oxygen, excuse me, not atmospheric, but high, high pressures of oxygen. And then we begin by pulsing just CO into the reactor. And what we expect to happen is, uh, as, as the surface oxygen becomes uh, reacted away, we should see some type of decrease in, in, in CO conversion, right? And sure enough, that's what we see. So on the left graph there, we see CO in the beginning is, 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 is very high, okay, coming out. And then at the end, on the opposite graph, you see CO2 production, okay, is, is increasing. Okay. And actually, I think I may have these labeled, so I apologize. The CO2 is actually on the left, I apologize for that, and the CO is on the right. So, in the beginning, we have a lot of CO2 production, and it decreases away. So again, we do our moment analysis, and we get this nice graph here. So, clearly, there's two regimes going on here, right? The left-hand side has this nice slope and then kind of reach this kind of steady state equilibrium. So what's going on? Well, we think that on the first segment where we have this, this, this slope, we have easily accessible surface oxygen, okay? And we can easily create a lot of, a lot of conversion. Now, as we, as we continue to, to deplete this easily accessible oxygen, perhaps into the, the, the first layers of the lattice, then we start decreasing our production and if you were to continue this for many, many more pulses, you would eventually uh, reach zero conversion. Okay? So that's pretty fancy. Uh, now I'm going to talk about pump probe. Okay? The, main, the main reason we do pump probe is we would like to be able to continue these experiments for a, a little bit longer duration. We want to understand a little bit more about these intricacies of oxygen storage. So I showed you that there's, there's clearly some, some easily accessible oxygen, and then there's some that's not so easily accessible. So in this, in this particular experiment, we actually, on, on the first pulse, we pulse in oxygen, okay? And on the second pulse, we pulse in uh, carbon monoxide. So the idea is, every time we react some oxygen, or excuse me, some, some oxygen away, we can replenish it 
with the oxygen pulse. Okay, that's the idea. All right, so here's some, here's some data. I hope I did it correctly this time. Looks like it is done correctly. Good. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have carbon monoxide exiting the reactor. You see in the beginning, there, there's quite a lot of conversion. There's not much carbon monoxide exiting. And on, on the flip side, the CO2, there's, there's quite a lot of conversion in the beginning, and it tapers off. So we do our moment analysis again. Okay, in, this, in this case, the, the, the data is a little bit noisy. Didn't have time to run it through our, 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 our filtering program. Um, but still, you can see that there's, there, there's, there's generally the same behavior. Okay, we still see this, the, this slope in the beginning and then some type of steady state. But the major difference is that now we're at a completely different uh, end conversion. So in the previous experiment, where we would completely, uh, where, when we would always, where we would always react the oxygen, eventually we would get to zero conversion. In this particular case, we never get there, okay? Because we're always replenishing some of that displaced oxygen from the next pulse, which is the oxygen pulse. Okay. okay. So that brings me to the isotopic switching experiment. Now this is uh, this is the same ideas as as the pulse as the pump probe, but now we simply label the oxygen. Okay. And the idea is. The catalyst is completely oxidized under, under high pressure, high temperature conditions, equilibrated, okay, using normal unlabeled oxygen. Okay. And then what we'll do is we'll pulse in uh, carbon monoxide, react some of the unlabeled oxygen, and then we'll pulse in some labeled oxygen and see what happens. Okay, got the idea? All right. So here's, here's pretty much what we see. Uh, when we see uh, CO2, which is completely unlabeled, we see a, 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 a large amount produced right at the beginning, and then it tapers off to some steady state value. But then when we look at the labeled CO2, the one that has used some of this, uh, this refilled oxygen that's labeled, we see in the beginning no conversion, which makes a lot of sense, right? We don't have any labeled oxygen in the beginning. And then we see this, this stepwise increase. Okay? So again, we do our zero moment analysis, and this is what we get. Looks like on labels. So the, the, the blue graph, or the, the, the blue trend, is overall CO2 production, labeled and unlabeled. Okay. And yet again, we see this, this, this two-phase area. First, in the beginning, we see this decrease, which is because we, we expect that we are removing some of the easily accessible oxygen. Right? And then as we're replenishing it under high vacuum conditions, we're not able to replenish it to the completely oxidized state. So we reach this somewhat steady state value. Okay. Now if we delve a little deeper, uh, if we look at the yellow curve, which is the unlabeled CO2, okay, we can see that in, in the beginning, unlabeled CO2 is, is produced at a high rate, and then it tapers off uh, at some value. But what's interesting is that, and I, w I wish I had a laser, uh, I don't sadly, uh, but you can see that there's, there's almost kind of two, two plateaus there. You see one, one in the middle and then kind of one towards, towards the right end of this graph. So it looks like as we continue pulsing, try the center. Well, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll deal with that. So it looks like as, as we're pulsing, um, we're allowing some of this perhaps buried oxygen, for lack of a better word, to diffuse to the surface and react. And certainly the pink curve is, is, is the labeled CO2, okay? And in the beginning, we see a, a very small conversion. And as we continue replenishing uh, the oxygen with labeled oxygen, we see this, this gradual increase. So I have some general overlying conclusions. It's gonna be a nice short talk. Uh, so the TAP reactor can give non-steady state kinetic information regarding complex reaction mechanisms. Okay, and I've showed kind of the, the first steps of that. And the, 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 easy, the easiest thing. Um, I showed you how we can control the surface metal composition and the oxygen storage amount. So the, the metal composition we can control with a laser deposition system. We can precisely uh, tailor the amount of transition metal that we deposit uniformly on the catalyst. And we can use the idea of oxygen uptake to precisely control the amount or the oxidation state of our catalyst. 
Uh, the pulse response experiments show a decrease in CO2 production as the surface oxygen is depleted. That's not surprising. Okay. And the pump probe experiment uh, serves to replenish the oxygen supply, although never getting us to the completely oxidized state that we began with. And finally, the isotopic switching gives a couple insights to, re to the reaction mechanisms. Okay. And we can, we can make the overlying conclusion that subsurface oxygen is, is clearly <coughs> migrating to the surface and contributing to CO conversion. So I want to thank you. Um, short talk today, but please, if there's any questions, I would be happy to try to answer them. so much so that it was below the detection limit uh, of, of, of our mass spectrometer. So I, I'm, I'm not aware of, 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 of any of that. Um, again, the same answer. Uh, I don't know why this thing is kind of moving by itself, but uh, it, we, we weren't able to see anything uh, per se, with, with, with CO perhaps sticking onto the surface and, 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 and dissociating and reassociating with the labeled oxygen. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't uh, viewable in this particular catalyst, and this was uh, palladium in, in, in our case, so not within our detection limits. What's the approximate number of catalyst activ activities? So, um, Could you repeat the question? Oh, yeah, so the, the question was, what, what was the number of activated sites on the catalyst? Um, I should say that in, 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 in most of these experiments, we typically use uh, 200 m milligrams of catalyst, and of that, a large fraction is obviously the inert support. Um, using the oxygen uptake experiment, okay, we were able to calculate on the order of, uh, of 1 times 10 to the 15th active sites per centimeter squared. And uh, you know that that seems in line with what people have reported in in the past. Did the first part of the curve depend upon how long you delayed between the oxygen treatment and the onset of the treatment? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So so the the question was during the first part of the curve, did it matter how long we delayed? between the pump and the probe, absolutely. And I haven't, I haven't shown that, but clearly, uh, if there's a large delay between the pump and the probe and also from the, pope, the, the, the probe to the pump, you allow more time for some of this, perhaps, uh, bulk oxygen, for lack of a better term, to diffuse to the surface, absolutely, absolutely. And that, actually, that's the point that brings us all the way back Let's see, let's go through all this. It brings us all the way back to this guy. Okay. It, it, it seems logical that as, as, as temperature is increasing, you know, there, there's, there's delays between how quickly we can collect data. And in fact, there's, there's a whole host of experiments that are called uh, dwell experiments uh, that we do. And absolutely, that, that is a huge factor. I just, I didn't present it in this. Absolutely. We actually, uh, we, we've, that was one of the first experiments we, we clearly did. And in the beginning, I won't lie to you, we did have some issues, not with the silica per se, but with our reactor. It actually turns out that our, our reactor had become contaminated and things like this, and we noticed some conversion. Uh, but after, after a thorough cleaning, uh, the conversion was such that it wouldn't affect, it wasn't uh, at all affecting these general trends. 
you see these oscillations if you boil the temperature constant? I mean, not ramp the temperature? If you, uh, if you hold the temperature constant, for example, and you raise it and then you <coughs> raise it and you hold it, and you continue pulsing reactant. So for example, let's, let's look at this, uh, this, uh, what the heck is it here? Well, we're going to have to go through all this jazz here real quick, but, no, not this one, the next one. In this particular experiment, it didn't, it didn't show with, with this data set, but there, there, there have been studies, again, using your idea of, of, of the dwell, where if you, for example, if you stop to save the data, okay, you can pulse a couple of thousand times and you need to stop to save the data. When you read the, when, when you start again, pulsing in just CO, okay, you'll see this, this kind of increase in, 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 in CO conversion. Okay, so clearly the amount of time that you wait allows something to happen. It seems to me that there's some type of diffusion coming to the surface. So absolutely, absolutely. It happens even at a constant temperature. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much. The presentation in this morning's session, it comes from the University of Michigan, uh, Levi Thompson, Tim King, and uh, Chang Wang.